So my name's Glenn Entis. I'm a partner at Vantage Capital. We're uh, a fairly, fairly new venture capital fund based in Vancouver. We focus on games, interactive media, and gamification. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I think, a kind of unreconstructed geek. You know, I just, I fell in love with computer graphics early in my life. My first job in computer animation was in 1977 on a Rut Etra video synthesizer. Um, I stayed in graphics for the early part of my career. I was a co-founder of Pacific Data Images back in the early 80s, and we took that company from the three of us who co-founded it through television commercials, uh, broadcast graphics, film effects, and I left there in 1994 to get into the games business and started in 1995 as the CEO of DreamWorks Interactive, which was the games division joint venture between DreamWorks SKG and Microsoft. Um, I was there until 2000 when that division was purchased by Electronic Arts. So I sort of I was I was sort of in the package, and and when they purchased DreamWorks Interactive, I came over to EA with that. I did a number of jobs at EA, and my most recent job there was senior vice president, worldwide chief visual technical officer for the 14 studios worldwide. And I left Electronic Arts in 2008 um, and started this uh, uh, with 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 my boss at the time. Electronic Arts was their worldwide studio president, Paul Lee. Paul and I started this new venture fund, Vantage Capital, together here in Vancouver, and that's what I've been doing since then. So the balance between creative skills and strengths and technology skills and strength and looking at the potential value of a company, it's a very interesting question. Because for one thing, um, it's, it's one of those questions that feels like it might, be a di- it might be a dichotomy, it might be an either or, and in fact, of course, it never is. Um, a group that's very creative and very creatively productive um, is going, one of the things they'll understand is uh, you can't be creatively productive without having great tools. So it's rare to find companies where you say, gee, they not only have creative potential, but, they, but that potential is realizing itself without also understanding that they've got some pretty interesting insight and sometimes some unique insight on what kind of tools and what kind of technology that they need. That said, company strengths center in different places. There may be a company that looks like they're in a position to create tremendous intellectual property creatively, and they're, they're adept users of tools, but they're not creating techn- technical IP. Or, or the reverse is obviously true. There's very technologically focused companies that are creating technical IP and not, and not creative. And in our business, um, I don't think it's an either or question. In other words, there's no, I don't think there's a standard answer. There are companies that we'll invest in that are strong creatively, Primarily, there's companies that will invest in that they're, they're very strong technically. That's what they do, and in some ways, some of the most interesting companies from a venture capital point of view um, are, are the ones that are neither. They're the ones that have a tremendous insight and creativity for understanding an entrepreneurial situation. You know, their brilliance and their innovation is in understanding a business model, understanding an unmet um, or, or 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 new need or appetite. Um, in their in their in their market, whether it's whether it's consumers or business, they understand there's a need, there's an opportunity. We've come up with a business model plan that can meet that faster and better than anyone else. And sometimes it may not be world class creativity or world class technology. It's world class intuition about about a market and a business opportunity. So it's really all over the map. Well, there's there's been tremendous changes, and the way I would put it is the. Um, uh, What's been interesting to me in how this landscape has changed is there has been, there's been tremendous convergence. And in some ways, that's not where the real story is or where the real interest is. To me, the real interesting part is where there's been uh, kind of explosion, fragmentation, and divergence. So, for example, in the last 10 years, there's been this incredible con- convergence of the people who are making films and people who are making high-end video games. Um, we saw it at Electronic Arts, a big, a big initiative that we had here at Electronic Arts um, over the last 10 years was starting to attract people from the film industry, get the visual quality of the games up to a point where they were, you know, they were great, great film artists like Henry Levanta or, or Habib Zargapur working on games and then bringing their past colleagues in. And there's this tremendous influx of talent and a raising of the bar of the, of the visual quality of the games. That's clearly a case of convergence. At the same time, um, smartphones, Facebook, casual games were exploding and represented a fragmentation of platforms like this industry's never seen. And what's interesting is, is that you look at a company like Zynga, 
that is absolutely not part of that convergence story, you know, they're going to go public at possibly $20 billion market cap, which is, you know, roughly three times more market cap than Electronic Arts has right now, you know, three times more than what Pixar sold to Disney for. So this is, this is, this is a sideshow to the convergence story, yet it's the sideshows right now that really are f really uh, much more indicative of how uh, the whole world is changing in their relationship to digital media. The quality and the immersion is in the convergence story. The way people's lives and habits are changing is on the divergence story. You know, the, the question of where do established players go in a time of upheaval is so interesting because it's a question about business strategy, it's a question about tools, pipeline, and processes, and it's a question about just human nature and organizations and, and you know, and how you change, you know, organizational and, and, and business habits. Um, Companies like Electronic Arts, it's 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 uh, you know it's an interesting challenge. They're they're very quickly moving, you know, into being very very strong players in 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 in, in, in digitally downloaded games, mobile games, iOS games, um, and, and that's a necessary part of the strategy is to figure out how do the old brands move over and 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 sort of take a position of dominance in these new platforms, and they're putting a lot of energy and getting a lot of results there. From a creative point of view. You know, when you think about building those games, um, it is so interesting because clearly there's lessons that can only be learned from people who are already well established in the space. And what, one of the things you find is a lot of the established companies are starting to buy up companies that, you know, whose DNA is solely, you know, solely founded within the mobile platform, smartphone pl platforms, Facebook platforms. Uh, so it's partly a matter of sort of grafting new DNA you know, into, into, into the core strands of the company and bringing some of that expertise in. The thing I always find interesting, though, you know, regardless of the, uh, how much upheaval, regardless of business model, is although there's important lessons about platforms, about particular tool sets and pipelines, the key issues in development always come down to human issues. It always ends up being a social problem. And I've seen this, you know, I've been working now in computer graphics for, for 34 years now, Obviously, the tools change. There's, there's big changes. But when you really talk to anybody who's managing a studio or managing a team, there's, there's always a host of problems. But almost invariably, they'll say our biggest issues, they end up being issues of creative management, of working with people and getting the most um, effective work out of them, of creating the right company culture and maintaining it, and then in a large company, making sure that the various pieces of the company that need to coordinate and really come to a focused point on a particular project actually do that in an effective way. And that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed, you know, in the 30 plus years of my career. I suspect that's been true for hundreds of years, and it probably will be true for, you know, at least until the singularity it'll be true, then something else will happen. But, but the, um, um, the focus of tools, then, from my perspective, is um, tools are there. Uh, uh, you know, there's always text and subtext. You know, the text of a tool is um, how does it move bits around? You know, what what thing does it let you create? What does it let you edit? What does it let you produce? The subtext of any good tool is what kind of workflow uh, does it does it promote and make easy? And then in a collaborative structure, which everything we're talking about is collaborative. Uh, the subtext of any good tool is what kind of collaborative workflow does it create? Does it make it easy or hard for me to work with someone? Does it make it a complete pain or a joy to share assets with someone? Uh, are we constantly banging into each other and destroying each other's work? Or does it make it really easy for us to sort of go back and forth and build into each other's work? If we're working remotely, uh, does that just does it does it feel like an excruciating process in you know communicating across distance and time zones and sometimes languages, or is it a very natural process where you really feel like there's a give and take, and that to me has always been the most interesting part of the production process uh, because it's the longest lasting. You can learn a lesson about a particular tool. Uh, and find that a year from now that 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 particular that particular sequence may, may be obsolete or may not be the best way to do things anymore. But what you learn about human nature and organizations in producing creative work, those lessons don't they, they don't have the same kind of half life, which tends to make them interesting because as you start to age in this industry and, and move on, you realize that the the, the, the the knowledge and insight you have just continues to grow rather than fading away. Um, you ask me about using a particular tool from the days I was an animator, and, and, and that's, 
you know, get the laugh track out. You know, it's just it's so primitive the way we did animation when, when I first started in animation. But I don't actually think any of the lessons that I've picked up along the way of uh, creativity in teams, creative productivity in teams, and how teams to work, I don't think any of those lessons have gone out of date. So, so you know, there's a layer, you know, between tool, workflow, and organization. Um, they're all strata of, of the same big issue. And when you talk about, you know, when we talk about the, con the divergence of platforms and casual games, social games, um, uh, smartphone games, um, those issues, they're going to be the same issues. It's going to be a new set of platforms, a new set of tools, a new set of players. It's going to be the same old issues. So, you know, the question of how do studios use distributed workforce and distributed uh, a pipeline uh, for, for strategic advantage is a particularly um, a timely issue here in, in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, for example, um, we're, we're seeing right now in Vancouver an explosion of studios uh, that, are, that are coming to town and setting up shop here. In 2009, we had Pixar Digital Domain, Sony Imageworks open up in town, Rhythm and Hughes is opening up in town, Prime Focus is opening up in town. There's a lot of major studios that are, that are, that are creating workforces here. And, and each of those companies has a slightly different philosophy about how they address the question about using that distributed workforce to a, uh, as, as, as a global strategic advantage. But, but that's clearly what they're thinking about. In some cases, there's literally, there's a single shot that's being shared across multiple studios with, with, with specialists in different areas all collaborating on that one shot. In some cases, they're, they're working on the same show in different facilities, but, but the shots are divvied out. And then in other cases, for example, Pixar, you know, a project that happens in Vancouver is a Vancouver project, and one that happens in Emeryville is an Emeryville project, and the projects themselves are separate. So there's, there's different strategies for different studios. But... I think that the thing that they all have in common is recognizing that uh, it's a global marketplace. The marketplace for talent is global. Um, and particularly with the big studios, with big shows, there's just, you have to be able to balance your load. You have to be able to move projects back and forth depending on where the capacity is. It doesn't make sense for a company like Digital Domain to be laying people off in LA and hiring people in Vancouver or vice versa. It makes sense for them to say, where's, what resources do we have as a company? And then how do we effectively marshal those resources for whatever project we have at hand? And, and, and by the way, it's actually, it's a lot better for the individuals involved too, if people can be in companies that can be, you know, a more stable employer because they're able to manage their work, their, their workflow efficiently. And what I hear, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the investment business now. I'm not running a studio. So really what I hear is vicariously from my friends who run studios. And we just had this conversation just a couple of days ago. Um, I had breakfast with three of the studio leaders here in town. And, and just one of the things we talked about at breakfast is we were talking about exactly that question about they were just comparing notes about how they manage the communication and breaking up shots and sharing production information. And what they all came down to was, it's a human problem. We have these tools, we use Skype, we use this production method, we divide up our resources or divvy up our shots this way. The issues always come down to individual A, individual B, do they understand each other? Do they get along? Do they trust each other? Are they working well together? And the tools, technology, and pipeline, you know, as I said before, they either encourage and support, they, they give the human issues either a nice, clear tailwind that makes things easier and faster and more productive, or they give it a blistering, you, you, you know, sort of dusty headwind that just makes things painful and gritty and you're constantly wiping your eyes out because it's just the way you're doing things is making it hard to see clearly. So the tools and technology in the pipeline make a difference. But that is the enabler of the real issue, which is how are people working together?